So with that being said, we're going to jump into the residual material on dynamic modeling. And um, uh, first I want to cover uh, some material uh, related to uh, multiple basins of attraction and, and equilibria. Um, for those interested in learning more on the dynamic modeling of compartmental disease, specifically for infectious disease, um, uh, I can post some videos. Um, uh, if people are interested, I'll also, also be welcome to attend my course um, uh, here at U of S, which will be covering this material in about another week, starting in another week for about five lectures in more detail. And there we cover, you know, issues um, in greater detail about the dynamics of uh, infectious disease compartmental models. Uh, we cover uh, issues that we'll be hitting on today with multiple basins of attraction. Um, uh, but also solving for equilibria, solving for the stability of the equilibria. Um, uh, so whether the equilibrium is fragile or, or really robust um, uh, and a key importance in, in public health. And, and finally, um, we'll be uh, also uh, covering uh, the impacts of vaccination on um, the dynamics of infection and the critical vaccination fraction. So if anyone's interested in that, um, you can post in the chat and, and I'll be glad to uh, post materials and refer to lectures uh, over here at the U of S, which would allow you to take in some of that coverage live with some exercises. Um, okay, um, but today we're just gonna hit on this issue of multiple bases of attraction because this bears directly on issues of data science and specifically um, uh, on issues having to do with some of the techniques like common filtering that we use to, to kind of create a consensus understanding from a model on the one hand uh, and from empirical data on the other and to track that model system state of the model to uh, the best guess of what system state is in the external world. Um, uh, it also bears on uh, some issues with data science that reflect um, uh, caveats or limitations or, or things we need to be cautious about with data science, um, which are changes in the data generating process, such as when we switch between basins of attraction and the data generating process, the process out there in the world, which is giving rise to the data that we're gonna be analyzing with all these wonderful data science tools, why suddenly the patterns in that might alter dramatically um, uh, in ways that would um, undercut our previous prediction mechanisms that are not causally rooted and uh, require formulation of new mechanisms for for prediction um, in the new regime. Um, it will finally, it will serve as motivation for causal data science techniques, uh, which we may cover in the closing weeks of the term. Um, so uh, with, with that header having been shared, I'd like to dive into some remaining slides. And I will be going through these whip quick, recognizing that there are a subset of a set of slides you can see in those videos that I'll be sharing or you could see in my course um, in another two or so weeks time. Okay, um, so uh, here we go. Uh, so last time we had covered um, the dynamics associated with a closed population where we have a starting set of susceptibles, which is drawn down by infection spread by an outbreak um, and uh, recovers ramp up, infections rise and then come down. And we noted that um, uh, that that the speed and the steepness uh, of that rise, the, the sharpness of the curve was governed by a set of parameters, particularly by parameters such as uh, C, the contact rates, beta, the risk of transmission per discordant contact, and the average duration of infectiousness mu. Um, uh, and uh, we had derived some quantities such as the basic reproductive number and the effective reproductive number which keeps tracks of, of the number of individuals infected by an index in, individual over the course of their, of their uh, infectiousness uh, in the current context. Um, now in a closed population, 
we had this kind of rise and collapse, and it's driven by um, depletion of susceptibles. Um, we saw that once uh, susceptibles uh, fall below a certain fraction of the population, um, uh, then then uh, it can no longer it will no longer be efficient for a um, for a infective to infect people, and that will undercut it. And we had this kind of tipping point uh, at the top of this curve where each infective is infecting just one person before they recover. Um, and uh, there the effective reproductive number is one. And the fraction of susceptibles in the population is one over the infective reproductive number. Um, excuse me, one over the, yeah, the basic reproductive number. Um, uh, so um, having, having said that, um, uh, this case where we have this kind of starting and ending with infection extinction in, a, uh, in the case of a um, closed population, uh, it tends to be a good approximation for certain you know, limited contexts, um, an outbreak of measles in an under-vaccinated community that runs its course and then it's extinguished. Maybe it's imported from another country, it runs its course and it's extinguished, or pertussis in today's uh, age of flagging vaccination, community vaccination rates. Um, but um, there's many other contexts uh, that we're interested in where we have a, uh, a population that's open or recycling. And in these cases, we get qualitatively different behavior possible because we have a, uh, a challenge associated with endemicity. Um, so if we have the same basic model, but we have recovery from infection, excuse me, not recovery from infection, waning of immunity, uh, where we have um, no persistent or no sustained immunity, no permanent immunity, be a better way to put it. Um, uh, we can uh, get dynamics which are radically different from what we've seen thus far. This sort of um, rise and fall that we saw here, this um, rise and collapse that we see over time here or in state space here um, is, 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 goes into the background and instead we have the risk that this will stay persistent with ongoing infection occurring within the population made possible because fuel is being added to the fire as new people become susceptible. Before we just had a fire with a limited supply of firewood and that fire eventually dies out. But now with waning of immunity, we're gonna have people who become susceptible again. It's shoveling fire, fresh firewood into the fire. That fire can, can, um, can, uh, can be sustainable. It can uh, rest in a sustained, sustained fashion. Um, so I'm not going to go through in our other class, uh, my other class, I, I go through and, and solve these things for equilibria. It's fairly easy to do. Um, in this case, because we have a conservation of people, no one dying, uh, no one coming in, um, there's a fixed size population and we can reduce the size of the population and we can solve what are the conditions under which this system will be at equilibrium? What are the values of SI and R uh, in which this system will be in balance? And instead of be, there being one you know, defined uh, value to rule them all, there's in fact two um, that will pop out of this. So we're gonna solve here for SI, and we can then calculate from the solutions for S and I, we can calculate a, a value for R. Um, and uh, there's a lot of algebra involved uh, in this, uh, but it's, it's standard algebra by, uh, uh, by simple, you can use Gaussian elimination, and you can arrive at essentially two equilibria. Um, the first equilibrium uh, has a situation where some susceptibles remain. That's not surprising. Susceptibles remain even for the, for the case of the closed population. But what's different here is that we have infectives remaining in equilibrium, 
and we have and we have recovered being in this sort of equilibrium. So here we're getting into a balanced situation where and each point here within this diagram, things are in balance. Susceptibles aren't changing because people going out is the same as people coming in. Infectives aren't changing because the number of new infections per day is the same as the number of recovered, recoveries per day. And recovered stay the same because recovery is equal to waning of immunity. And the system's in a kind of balance um, uh, for this equilibrium. This is called an endemic equilibrium. Um, and it turns out that beyond this, there is a disease-free equilibrium um, in which I equals zero and we have S equals N, meaning the whole population is susceptible. Um, I is zero and R, R is equal to N. Those are the two equilibria. And that's the important point. There's two very distinct equilibria here. One with no disease whatsoever and one with what could be lots of disease uh, circulating, where it's just stayed endemic, it's remained present. Um, this is a very different context from what we saw with a closed population. With a closed population, the infection ripped through the population, depleted the susceptibles to the point where it's no longer sustainable and disappeared. And we had the equilibrium value equal to of, of I equal to zero. Um, uh, and uh, S equal to some residual fraction of the population, a very small fraction if you have a high basic reproductive number. By contrast here, we have the infection remaining. And it's a similar thing for an open population, a population where for simplicity in this treatment, um, we're gonna have births and deaths occurring at the same basic rate uh, and um, people are going to be coming in and leaving, uh, and we could again solve for these equilibria, and we'll get two equilibria. One where we have an endemic equilibrium where it stays uh, sustainable, and the other, again, a disease-free equilibrium. So these are cases where, you know, for this uh, system, we can have uh, very different circumstances. One no infection whatsoever, one where infection is rooted in the population and um, uh, is, is a potentially prominent feature of the current landscape. Um, this shows an example of endemic equilibrium. Uh, so the system is starting with every, just about everyone uh, susceptible, one infective. Um, the number of infectives is shooting up initially. The Number of susceptibles declines until just as before with the closed population, it's no longer sustainable. Each infective infects just one person. The effective reproductive number is one. The number of people uh, in the population who remain susceptible is one over the basic reproductive number. And it starts its, uh, its decline then, um, the number of infectives. But the difference is now, um, as was the case with the circulating population, you get a resurgent, a resurgence of susceptibles. Um, in this model with births and deaths, where we have people leaving uh, the population due to death, that's what this omega fraction is. Um, and then we have people coming in and we're gonna say at the same rate, just to keep the analysis simple. Um, why is it, if you have that, you have births and you have deaths coming in, why is it that you think the number of susceptibles starts to rise again, Phoenix-like, um, after it reached a minimum? We didn't see that for the closed population. The susceptibles just went down and down and down and, and kind of plateaued but here it starts to rise. Why is that? What is it about this situation with births and deaths that allows this to rise, the susceptibles? Who's coming in there? Who's, who's coming into susceptibles in this model? Uh, who's coming, uh-huh? Uh, uh, rate of uh, contact, because of rate of contact, uh, so susceptible is rising. Okay, so contacts here are occurring and they're still occurring. 
and that's and uh, omega uh, is um, very yes. low. Okay, okay. If omega is very low, um, uh, yes, you this could be depleted, uh, and and it'll continue until this is very small. In which case, omega. But what does this term represent here? I'm actually asking a simple question. What does this term represent? If this is depicting a situation with some people dying, people in all the stocks, I S I R, they all die per, you know, per year with a certain probability density, certain hazard rate omega, certain chance per year omega. But babies are born with a birth rate omega. Um, who is it that's depleting the, the or that's that's building up the susceptibles? Who's coming into the susceptible stock to, that allows it to rise? It's what? Newborn. It's newborns. Newborn. Yeah, newborns are coming in. The babies are coming in. The bambino. So so the babies are coming in here, and they're allowing this um, the susceptibles to rise, and it rises above its equilibrium value, um, and. And then that sets the stage for a subsequent wave. Um, uh, yeah. I think uh, this chart is uh, Vida Bersandes. Um, um, sorry. sorry. The, the birth is, is with birth. And yeah, death. yeah. Isa. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is with births and deaths occurring. And the fact that there are births, um, deaths occur from any of the stocks in this model, but uh, births are occurring into the susceptible state. And so it's rising, rising, rising. And, and this gives rise to a subsequent outbreak. And you can kind of see it kind of oscillate until it reaches this equilibrium. And what happens at this equilibrium? Anyone want to hazard a guess? What is it that distinguishes? What is it that makes this so stable at this equilibrium? The, the, the fact that these are all stable. What's the... Um, and does anyone want to guess uh, what the effective reproductive number is at this equilibrium point where it's in balance? Uh, um, effective births and death is equal. Okay, that's true. It, it, births and deaths are equal here. That's true. I've actually designed them to be equal. Um, I designed, you know, omega times S plus omega times I plus omega times r, if you add them together, that's omega times quantity s plus i plus r, which is n. And so I designed them through, with malice of forethought to be equal, um, uh, just to keep the analysis simple here. Um, but uh, so they are equal. But what's the effective reproductive number here? Anyone? What is the effective reproductive one. number? It's one. one. It's one. If it were. Different than one, we would have a mini outbreak. Um, and that's occurring earlier, but it's one here. It's it, Everyone's a balance. So at this point, um, we have effective reproductive number equal one, and each infective re just replaces themselves, right? They infect one person, one candidate person. They find them, and then they can retire, OK? Um, uh, and uh, we have this, you know, whenever we have this situation where susceptibles our susceptibles are blue here. Whenever they're above that level, we're going to get a growth in infectives uh, that will be instigated. Um, uh, whenever it's low here, we're going to have, uh, when, whenever the susceptible fraction is lower than this blue one, uh, we're going to have the number of, um, uh, the number of uh, infectives in the population the outflow will be greater than the inflow and, all, and it will fall. Um, and and, and uh, it, it will be inefficient for them to transmit. So this is a very different context um, than what we saw earlier with the closed population. And in fact, um, uh, you know, in general, for many um, infectious disease models, we'll have multiple equilibria. In these two cases, we have, it's a simple case, we have two. If people are interested, I could show you models with more than two. Um, and there's some really neat ones. Um, here we have two disease-free and endemic equilibrium. And um, a, a key concern in infectious disease modeling and in public health even more so is the stability of these equilibria, meaning um, to what degree 
are they stable to perturbation? If, if, if you have a disease for equilibrium, um, uh, you know, a case with no measles, you'd like your public health system to be stable. If, if someone came in with measles, you know, it would, maybe they'd infect a couple of people, but it'd be quickly contact traced, you'd pin it down and, and it would be brought back into, into equilibrium. There'd be no big outbreak. Um, uh, that's what we'd ideally like. Um, that obviously wasn't the case with COVID. Um, uh, we had an unstable disease for equilibrium. Endemic equilibria, um, we'd like it to be unstable to drive the infection out of the population and back to a disease-free state. But the way things are going with COVID in the West, it's likely to be endemic. Um, and uh, we're likely to have a situation where it, it persists. And so it'll be critically stable or, 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 or uh, you know, a, a situation where it's stable. So here is actually a situation where the endemic equilibrium is stable. If you perturb it, if you have a busload of 100 infected people come into this jurisdiction, um, um, it will end up restoring the fraction of those who are susceptible, it'll come back to this uh, to this basic equilibrium. Um, but the frequency of the um, of the turnover will will make a, a difference, or the the um, speed of the turnover. For example, if we have twenty percent population turnover, we'll very quickly go to this equilibrium. Um, whereas if we have something like um, that's blue. Uh, whereas if we have something like uh, the green one, which is 5% um, annual population turnover, we will have you know, these uh, oscillations with new outbreaks occurring infrequently, say every uh, six years or so or seven years, which is exactly what we would see in the pre-vaccination era with things like measles um, or pertussis. We also had this regular cyclicality, these kind of periodic outbreaks because the babies become susceptible and uh, they build up a, a critical set, you know, pool of susceptibles and you get bang, you get an outbreak occurring that depletes them and then it's stable for the next bunch of years. So, um, the, you know, how, how quickly the population turnover uh, relates to how, um, you know, what, uh, what's the minimum fraction of infectives in the population, how, how uh, rare infections become um, in between these outbreaks, how frequent the outbreaks are, and, um, and uh, how long it is until it reaches some sort of endemic equilibrium imbalance, if indeed it does. And there are cycles, there are cases where it engages in what's called a limit cycle, and it just circles around an equilibrium rather than ever stably getting into it. Um, we won't nearly have time to cover that. But from a phase space perspective, this is what we, you might remember, this is what we saw with no birth and death. The infection starts, it spreads to the population. This is infectives here on the, I, on the, X, the Y axis, the uh, vertical axis, susceptibles here. We start all susceptible with only one infective. And then it rises number of infectives, depleting susceptibles until it's no longer sustainable. And then down come the, the infectives, but they're still infecting some susceptibles until it comes to rest without in the absence of infection. Now, instead, we're getting these sort of situations where it's cycling around an equilibrium. Um, uh, and this is with a high birth and death rate. If we go to a somewhat lower birth and death rate, it reduces the equilibrium, uh, frac the number of, of infectives in equilibrium down um, by a bit. If we go to 0.02, it reduces it yet further. Um, and if we make it 0.05 or 0.01, and you can really see these cycles, you know, it takes more cycles to kind of zero in on this, to hone in on, on this equilibrium point. Um, and in general, with these models, with dynamic models of infectious diseases, it's very common to have these multiple basins of attraction where we have different areas of state space where you know, the system can end up in different spheres. We can end up with a situation with very high levels and we're always firefighting. 
or a situation with very low levels, but it's still endemic and it only occurs occasionally, or situations where it's totally eliminated. Um, and uh, you can have cases where if you just invest enough resources, um, you can nudge it from one side to the other. Maybe it's a matter of healthcare workers, for example, that you have on hand, whether it goes extinct or whether it takes off. Um, and uh, here uh, we could have a situation where it's the same basic system, but we're in these different modes of the system, these different regimes of the system that dynamical system um, uh, uh, scientists will use to describe this situation. So just be aware when we're dealing with nonlinear systems, we can have very different circumstances, very different regimes of behavior. Much of data science is set up with an eye towards understanding the patterns coming from the current data generating process. But this is a reminder of the fact that when it comes to infectious diseases of all things, we can have very different current contexts depending on your current, you know, the, the situation and time. The patterns that obtained early on in the pandemic are very different from the, pan, from the situations now with Omicron, and yet very different from what we'll probably see five years from now with endemicity and cycling uh, periodically, seasonally, uh, forced by uh, seasonal changes in schools and, and people going inside and, and ventilation and, and so on. Um, so that's what I wanted to say. In my other class, I explored these matters in some greater depth. I apologize for the brevity of my treatment, but um, this will come back um, and we'll see this again, uh, these basic patterns, these basic signs. In fact, these sort of, exactly these sort of uh, patterns coming out at us from our data um, at several points uh, during, during the course of the subsequent semester. Um, okay, um, so those are my comments um, in concluding on this issue of uh, compartmental models of infectious disease, kind of a, the very, very basics that we need for this course, okay? Um, uh, having said that, I'm going to stop.